Hey everyone, welcome back to the channel. Today I wanna to talk about five tips to improve your audio, your hi-fi, your system. I'm gonna tell you five things that I've learned over the years, five no-nos of hi-fi basically. Don't do these five things. And by not doing these things, you will actually improve the sound of your system. So let's start with number five. We're gonna start with number five and go all the way to number one. Number five, never look for perfection when you're buying audio gear or auditioning audio gear because perfection, I should say the best, doesn't exist. The best does not exist in audio. Uh, I've used that term many times. This is the best I've ever heard in my system. But in reality, what I mean by that, the best within my system with my components for my ears and listening preferences. When you're auditioning gear, there, there's no such thing as a perfect DAC, a perfect amplifier, a perfect streamer, or a perfect set of speakers. We analyze, um, we look at specs, but really the only thing that matters is if that sound sounds good to us where we're going to be the ones listening to it, uh, sometimes on a daily basis. But perfection, we can get wrapped up in buying a gear, piece of gear. I'll give you an example of why you shouldn't look for perfection. Say you buy a piece of gear or audition a piece of gear and you love it. You're like, wow, this is an improvement over what I had before. This is perfect, right? This is awesome. I'm going to purchase it. I'm going to sell my old piece and I'm going to be happy for life. A lot of us audiophiles or those of us into high-end audio say that, and we really, really like what we're hearing when we put it in the system. But somehow, a few months go by, in some cases a few weeks, and for some reason, we're looking for something else. We're looking for something better, right? We're always looking for something better, something more perfect in the realm of our audio gear. And to be honest, it doesn't exist. If you replace that piece you loved when you put it in with something else, you might like the new piece less. I've traveled down this road many times where I loved a piece, but then I kind of got bored with it for whatever reason, sold it and bought another piece that I thought I liked, but then later I missed the original piece. So instead of looking for perfection and always looking for the best, just try to find a piece that speaks to you and try to hold on to it long term. For me, it's a process. I have to search and try and audition and test several products before I find the one that's right for me. But even I know that those pieces that I chose that were the best for my ears are not the best for everyone, right? It's, it's all a personal choice. So try not to... Um, Stress yourself on always looking for better because you may have that better piece. You may already have it in your system now. So chasing perfection is a loser's game in hi-fi, meaning you will lose a lot of money buying and selling, and you really will never be happy with what you have because if you're buying and selling and buying and selling, nothing's ever coming together. Um, but when you finally get something that you're like, wow, this, if you're sitting in your system one night and you're saying to yourself, this sounds as good as I could ever want it, keep those pieces in your system because if you change just one thing, it could have a bad negative effect on the sound, leading you to chase down what the problem is. So never look for perfection in audio because it doesn't exist. Let's move to number four. Number four. Uh, never assume that the more expensive audio pieces are going to be better than less expensive audio pieces. This is not always the case. While high-end, really expensive SummitFi, UberFi, crazy expensive pieces like those 15,000, 20,000, 30,000 and up DAX, 20, 30,000 dollar uh, preamps, those are drool worthy. I used to be guilty of reading through the audio review magazines back in the day, absolute sound, stereophile, and I would lust after these high-end pieces of gear, knowing at the time I probably would never be able to acquire any of them. And I would sit there and I would fantasize about 
or, or, or imagine what this would sound like. Man, imagine if I had that piece. It would just sound amazing. Well, over the last 35 years, I've listened to so many audio pieces, some in the hundreds of dollar range, some in the tens of thousands of dollar range. And while the expensive products, those crazy price products, are built to a really high standard, they're solid, they're heavy, they give you that confidence that whoever built this had passion behind them and knew what they were doing, the parts quality, is uh, extraordinary, right? But sometimes these really expensive pieces can sound lifeless in some systems. Sometimes I've heard speakers that were in the six figures that sounded sterile and lifeless to me. And at the same time, I've heard speakers under 5,000 that had life and energy and a humanity about them that spoke to me more than the expensive stuff. I just tested that little Enlium Amp 23R. It's not cheap, it's like 6,400, I believe, retail 63, 62, something like that. But it sounds better to me than some amps that were double, some integrateds that were double the price in this little simple box. So just because something's more expensive doesn't always mean it's going to be better in your system. Um, I've experienced this again and again and again. The pricey product, sometimes you're paying for the name. Much like with a Leica camera, you're paying for that Leica red dot. You're not really getting any kind of technology or anything that's going to give you a better image than, say, a Sony that's four times less expensive. Same kind of thing happens in audio. In the camera world, the Leica is going to look beautiful. It's going to feel handcrafted. It's going to feel amazing. And for some people, that's enough to spend the extra on. But if you're just talking about sound quality and performance, you don't have to spend those crazy fortunes to get high-end refined sound. It's really more comes down to your speaker placement, your synergy and matching, and where you're placing the speakers. Let's move on to number three. Number three has to do with cables. Now there's, it's the cables are probably the most controversial, well not really the most controversial, but it's a controversial topic within the realm of high-end audio. We can buy speaker cables that cost 10 bucks for our speakers, or we can spend $100,000, yes, $100,000 on speaker cables and uh, interconnects. It's absolutely mind-blowing insanity, the way I look at that. Now, I'll never buy those six-figure cables. I'll never buy $50,000 cables. I'll never buy $15,000 cables. I'll never spend $10,000 on a pair of speaker cables. I've gotten close to that when I was in my Nordust phase, and those cables were fantastic. Worth the money, the retail price? No, I wouldn't think so, but they do change the sound of a system. Cables can change the sound of a system. So one thing you never wanna do in hi-fi when building your system is just buy a set of five to $10,000 speaker cables. I'll just say pricey speaker cables, even $1,000. You never wanna buy cables uh, that are in these kind of price brackets without hearing them first. Because number one, you might not hear a difference. Not everybody can hear a difference. It depends on the transparency and the quality of your amplifier, your speakers, your DAC, etc. cetera. Um, expensive cables are usually reserved for crazy expensive systems, say 50,000, 100,000, $500,000 systems. I can then understand putting some of these crazy cables in. Now, I believe cables make a difference. I've passed a blind test with cables here. I can hear the difference between my Cardist Clear Reflection and a pair of $30 uh, cables. I can hear that difference. Is the difference worth the money in difference cost? Not to most people. Um, but if you're building a system that you're, you're trying to dial in, cables can really polish off the system at the end. But never, this is the no-no, never just buy cables online unless you hear them first because they can um, make a small improvement. They can make a negative change to your system. I bought a pair of cables once that were 500 bucks. I put them in 
and the sound shrunk, it got hard and bright, and I instantly sent them back. Now, luckily, I was able to send them back, but cables can have that kind of an effect. They could be worse, they could be a little bit better, uh, or you might not even hear a difference at all. So always try to audition cables if you can. There's the cable company, they're out there, and they allow you to um, basically borrow cables. You know, you gotta, I don't know, if, I've never done it, but I've heard a lot about it. I think you pay a deposit or you put a credit card down, you get to try them, and then you send them back. If you wanna keep them, you keep them, and you pay for them. So that was number three. Uh, be sure you audition cabling before you commit to buying if you're spending, I'd say, over a thousand bucks. Number two. Number two uh, has to do with your room, where you're putting your speakers. And I made a massive mistake um, one time in my system that was really, really hard for me to accept because I lost some money there, a lot of money there. Um, one other thing, number two, the number two thing you never want to do in hi-fi, if you have a small room, right? I had a 12 by 13 room uh, when we lived in Arizona, and that room was really just big enough for bookshelves, two-way speakers, Speakers that are not huge are gonna overload the room with bass energy, right? And I remember buying a pair of Sonus Faber Guarneri Evolutions, and I loved those speakers. They were warm, plump, they hit hard, but they were juicy and ripe almost. A different kind of sound than most speakers, especially from what I listen to today. Uh, but at that time, I was into that vibe of Sonus Faber, um, and I just lusted after the Amati Futuras, right? And those were retail $40,000, $45,000. And um, I just wanted those Amatis. And I knew there was a voice inside of me saying, Steve, those are going to be too big for the room. But I went to the dealer and I said, I'm thinking about changing these to the Amatis. And can you give me a good price on the swap? And he was going to give me full what I paid for the evolutions toward the Amatis. And he was like, oh yeah, they'll sound better in that room, right? He should have told me, of course. I told him what size my room was and I should have known, I did know, but I got those delivered. They took the evolutions. I had the evolutions playing when they came and I was like, what am I doing? These sound so good in here. They put the Amatis in and it was instantly just too much for the room. The speaker sounded um, slow, a little muffled. That was because all the bass coming out of them, the room couldn't handle. You know, the bass was kind of overloading the corners and sp spots of the room, and, and it was just not a good match. Um, I remember running them in for a while. They started to sound better, and as long as I kept them at low volume, they sounded magical. But if I went to just a little bit on the volume dial, not loud, the bass would overpower the room. And that's how I learned my lesson as, as speaker size versus room size. It's common sense and I should have known, but if you have a small room, you're gonna to wanna to put a smaller speaker in that room to avoid overloading the room with energy, bass energy mostly. Um, I, I've always had a hard time with bigger speakers in a small room and that's just how it is. If you have a big room, you're not gonna to wanna to put little bookshelf speakers in there, especially without a sub. If you have a sub, it's okay. But you don't want to put small speakers in a big room and you don't want to put big speakers in a small room. Um, that should be obvious, but a lot of you are new to audio and hi-fi watching these videos. So I thought I would mention that because I made that mistake many, many years ago and it was a big one. Let's move on to number one. The number one thing you don't want to do with your audio system. Okay, number one, right off the bat, this is something that can help your system sound better instantly if you have the ability to do it. Um, it has to do with your speaker positioning. Uh, a lot of people send me pictures of their system and ask me my opinion on the setup or the room. And a lot of times these pictures coming in, they show the speakers right up against the back wall, meaning they push that speaker all the way to the wall it's aimed straight out and they have this component rack in the middle and um, they're wondering how come they're not getting that holographic sound stage, the things I talk about and others talk about in audio reviews. The problem is if you put those speakers against the wall, you're not allowing them to breathe. 
And if you're not allowing that sound to emit and go around, wrap around into the room, it's going to sound congested. It's going to sound um, the opposite of wide open. It's going to sound closed in, like I said, constricted, but you're not going to get that imaging. You're not going to get the holographic sound stage and that three dimensionality because you have too much going on in between the speakers, right? You need to pull those speakers out into the room. You want them at least a couple feet. I think mine are three feet from the back wall. And you want to pull them away from your side walls. You don't want anything in between the speakers to the left or right or behind it, right? You want them to be in a semi-open space. And I know in small rooms it can be hard. But even in my 12 by 13 room, I would pull them out two, three feet from the back wall and a couple feet from the side wall. I would make sure nothing was placed in between the speakers. So they were just kind of out in the open. This will open up the sound and your bass will become less pronounced, but this is more on how um, you should listen, or this is more the more correct uh, way for the music to be portrayed, right? Music doesn't have big, boomy bass. Uh, there are tracks that where it's pumped in to be big, boomy bass, but if you listen to those tracks on a well-set-up system, your bass should never boom or overpower the room. If your bass is overpowering the room just from your speakers, they are not set up correctly. Once you pull them out, you will hear less of that boomy bass, but you'll hear a much cleaner and more holographic mid-range and top end. And at first, it might be hard to get used to because you'll say, oh, I want that driving bass, and you'll still have good bass, but you'll be hearing all of the music, all of the details. Um, it might even just be a personal preference. You might even prefer it to go back against the wall for that uh, muffled bass sound, which a lot of us actually enjoy. A lot of people enjoy that sound. But if you're looking for the holographic sound stage, the three-dimensionality, the air, you need to pull those speakers out from the walls. You don't want anything in between them. If you have the capability in your room to do that, that alone will improve the sound of your system dramatically. So that was it, five easy tips, five no-nos of hi-fi. I hope you enjoyed it. If you did, thumbs up and subscribe. I'll have more videos very soon, and I will see you next time. I'll see you later.